So I just want to say a few things about Shelly. Um, Shelly Mahone, she's an outgoing executive director of the Parent Engagement Network for Boulder, Boulder County, Boulder Valley, is it? And uh, she holds a doctorate in human development and family studies with a minor in prevention science. Uh, she specializes in adolescent development, risk and resilience, and program development and evaluation and parent child relationships. She has over 25 years of experience working with youth and families in a variety of contexts. Shelley believes that youth and families need to both celebrate their accomplishments and have the tool for constructive conversations about real issues. So without further ado, let's welcome Shelley Mahone to Interface. Thanks, Thank Shelley. you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my uh, my last name is actually uh, pronounced Man, but don't feel bad because it's either Mahone or Mahone or a variety of other things most of the time. So please don't feel bad. Um, it's like McMahon, like the the sports person. Um, so so yes, thank you for for having me. I'm really excited to be here. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, it is the source of what um, launched me into the career that I've had. Um, I had my first college class when I was 18 years old, entered at CSU and um, was a vocal performing arts major at the time. Sat down in my first human development course and the instructor said, we're gonna talk about why some kids make it and some kids don't make it regardless of their circumstances. Um, and I was fascinated and thrilled. And within the first month of college, I switched my degree to human development and family studies and then proceeded to get a master's degree and a PhD in the same exact field. So um, I fell in love at 18. So this is, um, risk and resiliency is, is a topic that's near and dear to my heart and something that I have, have really been researching and studying and seeing an application in the work that I've done for a long time. Um, in terms of my background, I've, uh, I've had, I like to say I've had kind of the, the opportunity to have multiple careers. So I started my first career in, in criminal justice. So I. I was a probation officer and then I moved to the sheriff's department where I, um, I basically did work in or work release programs. So I was that person that drove a, a big school bus of about 30 guys that came in and did weekend jail time. And um, you know, we went out and picked up trash, which people see a lot, but we also did things like um, build fence, fix roofs, restore cabins in the mountains. Um, I learned how to do a lot of interesting things. So I'm quite handy when it comes to drywalling or painting. <laughs> um, and then at the end of that, I, that really pushed me into wanting to study prevention more. So I got very interested in wanting to be on the other side of how do we build up and support people versus how do we fix things when things have gone wrong. Um, and of course, the audience here today, you know, you all work in practice and you work with families. So, you know, it's a little bit of both, right? We have we have the things that we can do to prevent and we have the things that we have to work with afterwards. Um, but it did kind of launch me back into a master's program. And that is really where I got more involved in social work. Um, I chose not to go the counseling route, the, the marriage and family therapy route, and instead did program development and evaluation. Um, I got interested in adventure therapy and worked on a ropes course for 10 years. Um, and then I just throughout this entire time, I've taught in university for about 20. So um, it's really just been something that I've been engaged in and interested in my whole life. Uh, as I look and, and reflect on what is it that's the common theme in all the work that I've done and all the things that interest me, it really comes down to parent-child relationships, um, being engaged and curiously interested in supporting your kids as they grow and develop, um, and really being present. And so um, now I just left a position as the executive director for the Parent Engagement Network. Um, some of you may be familiar with them. We've, we've put a lot of presentations on. So Barry and I were having a fun laugh about how, you know, you do, you do something and you don't know who's going to come and you just put it out there and all the right people are here to hear whatever is being shared. So um, did a lot of that work. I worked with them for about six and a half years as their executive director. And now I'm not retired. I'm working part time um, for... This is going to sound like a very weird shift, but um, it actually makes sense. I'm working part time as a um, in a marketing department for a tech company, um, where I'm their researcher, writer, copy editor, um, and in the other part time 
um, of my life. I'm writing my own book and getting back into creating my own content, which is really what I fell in love with when I was um, when I was in school. So um, I am hoping to continue to put more information out into the world. Um, and I'm still going to host our, if you, if you haven't heard of it, we have a podcast called the Parenting Well Podcast with Parent Engagement Network. And I'm going to continue to host that podcast. It's one of my favorite things. So um, at this point, I think we've done about 20, 22 conversations. Um, and they're all around the topic of raising resilient families, um, substance use, stress and anxiety, and managing technology in our kids' lives. So um, it's a pretty fun thing. And I've had some pretty neat guests on there. So um, so please check us out if you haven't had a chance to see that. So today's conversation, I am going to share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint, but my style is very interactive. And especially with the group that we have, a small group, please feel free to, you know, raise your hand, put things in the chat. Um, Barry's going to help me keep an eye on it if I miss something, but happy to be in a conversation. Um, one thing about presenting on a topic like this with people who work in the field is uh, you probably have more knowledge about risk and resiliency and protective factors than, than sometimes it would be if I'm presenting to a, a group of parents. So hopefully this information brings some new thoughts or sparks some ideas for you. Uh, but if you have experience and knowledge that you wanna share or things that you've seen in your own career, please, uh, please jump in and share that with us. So I'm gonna hop over here and share my screen. So yeah, so today we are going to talk about what it takes emerging stronger from challenging times and specifically, you know, we've just been through a pretty tough year. So specifically, we'll be talking about that. Um, the agenda is to look at a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail about where we are right now. Uh, look at some of the, the impacts of COVID-19 on mental health. Talk about resilience look at the role of risk and protective factors, and then look at 10 strategies that you can use to tap into your resilience in difficult situations. So, so to start, you know, where we are right now. Um, right now we are, we're experiencing trauma in a way that we haven't experienced trauma before. So um, in the past, we've gone through things like 9-11. We've had devastating storms and fires around our country. Um, in this last year, we've, we've seen um, Black Lives Matter, we've seen the killing of a lot of innocent people, we've seen the riot at the Capitol um, and shootings around the country, including in our own community. And what has overlaid all of this is the pandemic, something that we've never really had to experience before. And one of the things that I think is important about this is that the pandemic took us away from being able to be in community. So there's really not been another time in history where we've been socially isolated in this way, where we're dealing with all these different traumas, but we actually can't be in community. And so a result of that has been some polarization um, and paired with the isolation that we experienced from COVID-19. So one of the things we can do is we can start to look at how has this impacted us, us individually? How is it impacting the people around us? And to really think of it from the place of um, it's, it's relative. We're all going to have our own experience. So for what has been hard for some people may not be hard for somebody else and to really just have some compassion uh, for what people are dealing with. So one of the things I want to share here, this information comes straight out of Harvard um, from a researcher by the name of Kara Stan Cohen, and she is the professor of psychiatric epidemiology in the School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, and she shared this, uh, this information that characterizes the way in which what we've gone through has created stress and anxiety and ultimately has had an impact on people's mental health. And again, given the population, you know, given what you do for a living, you've seen this firsthand yourself. Um, so some of the things uh, that, that we're seeing is that this is novel. Like I said in the previous slide, this is really one of the first times that we have been in this situation. And so we've had to kind of learn as we go. Um, it's also threatening. So we have to worry about not just our health, but our jobs and our safety and our security. And then on top of that, it's unpredictable. So since we have never experienced this before, we're living with this feeling of we have no control or ability to predict exactly what's going to happen. And that has to do with COVID-19, but also all the things that are occurring because of 
COVID-19. So changes in our economy and the way in which people are responding to the different stages as we go through this, including vaccinations, new strains, things like that that are starting to happen. And then overlaying all of that, we have some additional factors. So the social, social isolation that I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, some people, I actually have a, a dear friend that's like, the pandemic has been the best thing that ever happened to me. But he also happens to be one of the most introverted people I know. And so for him, yes. Oh. No, also an introvert. It hasn't been that bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that that's been a common thing. I think I learned that I was more introverted than I realized I was. Um, for, for me, it was, um, I had an opportunity to slow down and, and, and like gave myself permission to slow down a little bit. Um, I bought chickens, you know, I have, I have nine chickens in my backyard. So just fun little things that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I can't see the chat the way I'm sharing my screen. So raising your hand or even just kind of, you know, somehow letting me know that you want to speak is really helpful. Um, so, so yeah, so some people, you know, they're experiencing um, more depression and sadness or anxiety because they can't leave or they can't spend time the way they have. And one of the things I've seen, and maybe given the work you do, you've seen similar things, but um, one of the things I've seen is children having a difficult time children having to go back into social environments after being kind of trained to not be in those environments and having a lot of stress and anxiety and having a very difficult time re-entering some of the um, places like schools and sporting activities, even work functions. Um, a, a good friend of mine had a child right before. And so that child is like a year and a half and literally has a difficult time being outside with other people because their whole life that that's all they know is that we wear masks and we stay home and we don't interact in large groups and so I think we just have to realize that we have to have some flexibility you know and that is one of the things that resilience is all about is being flexible we have to have some flexibility in terms of how are we going to support people in the ways that they're responding to these kinds of things um, and then in addition to that we have stigma so you know the, the polarization that is happening around the country and, and then the stigma toward, for example, Asian Americans or toward how people feel about going back to work or whether they're gonna get vaccinated or whether they're gonna vaccinate their children. Um, that's another layer on top of all this. And then the last thing that's in here is bereavement. And you know that has come across in a couple of different ways. It may be from actually losing somebody or it may actually be just from the loss of the things that you typically do or the, the way that you know life to be can also cause those feelings. So when we think about resilience, we think about being able to come back to that pre-crisis mode and to be able to do it easier. Uh, and so what are some of the ways that we can help people do that? Because it's something that at some level, it's almost impossible not to be impacted by this in some way. And so that's what we're going to do first. We're going to do a little breakout room. Um, and I think since we have a small group, we don't need to actually even go into breakout rooms. We can just share amongst ourselves. But what I want to do is really think about when you look at this last year, you know, we, from day to day, we experience change. And some of these changes are normal. And some of these changes are a little bit more traumatic for us. But they would still fall in the realm of normal in the sense that we know these sort of things happen in life. So um, an example would be a child transitioning to middle school, for example, that can be a traumatic experience or graduating and then trying to decide I'm in this space right now with my 22 year old, you know, trying to decide what am I really going to do with my life. Um, and then we have other things that happen, which may not be pleasant, but we know they happen, like having to move or change jobs, um, going through through a divorce, potentially losing a loved one. But where we're at right now, these, these challenges are slightly different um, in the sense that, you know, there's, there's lack of resources in certain ways. There's lack of opportunity um, to get the things that you need to cope with the situation. Uh, even how we can go to a gym has changed, right? In terms of, I just started swimming again and I have to sign up for my swim lane still, you know, during a certain half hour period. So, 
things have changed. So what I want us to do is really think about what has been most challenging for you over this last year? And in what ways do you think that it has been similar or different than other challenges that you've had to face? Okay. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about psychological resilience. Um, I kind of touched on this, but it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, um, the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with crisis and return to that pre-crisis status quickly, and the ability to use mental processes and behaviors that promote personal assets that protect you from the negative effects of a stressor. So I, I like that last, to talk about that last one especially, because this is where there's been different conversations about whether resilience is something that we have or something that we build. And it's clear that we can learn and we can build new ways of thinking and behaving that help us to be more resilient in particular situations. So synonyms of this are being flexible, um, pliable, having some give and take in a situation, um, strength, being adaptable. These are all characteristics, hardiness. You know, we talk about grit and how important it is to have grit. These are the things that help contribute to our resilience. And a huge part of the way I like to talk about it is that it is, um, it is more than just us and our personal characteristics. Resilience is embedded in the environment and the context in which we grow up or live and function. And so building resilience is really not happening just by itself. It's happening with and among other people. So one of the ways you can think about it is um, how do you personally typically respond to things? Like, are you a person who um, can step back and, and calm, calmly think and reset? Or do you react and then you kind of come back to it later. Um, temperament, for example, is one of the things that we look at when we talk about individual resilience, because that is one of the things we've seen is, is largely genetic. So it's interesting to think about it from that perspective. And then when it comes to your relationships, what do those look like? You know, and, and we just talked about some of that, some of the ways in which our relationships have been strained over this period of time and just not being able to do the things we love with the people we love in the way that we normally would. So, so when that happens, what kind of support network can you put together that helps you to manage that? Um, and then in your community, you know, what's available in your community and how is the community itself responding to the pandemic? If you look across our country, we've had very different responses in different parts of the world as it relates to how serious people take it, the practices, the policies, the laws they put in place, um, which brings us to society because society then is how does the laws, policies, norms, um, beliefs uh, within that culture, within the different cultures across the country, how are those then interacting um, with one another? And, and in effect, all of those end up having an impact on ourselves and how we can then be resilient. So this is where we start to talk about um, risk and protective factors because resilience, if you look at the resiliency model, it is really balancing out. We, we aren't ever going to avoid risk. We're, all, we're always going to, at some point or another, encounter certain risks, <coughs> excuse me. But the thing that counterbalances that are our protective, protective factors. So those are the things that basically serve as a buffer to the things that we're exposed to that are risky. And at the end, those things that we have in our environment, with our families, within ourselves, um, have either a negative or a positive effect. So this is a little bit more of a detailed diagram of what can be, what's in place within the child, the family, the school, life events, and your social environment. So uh, they're meant to be juxtaposed against each other in the sense that if you look at child, um, a risk factor is a child with a difficult temperament, low self-esteem, negative way of thinking. On the other side, someone who has an easy temperament, good social and emotional skills, and is optimistic. Optimism is actually known to be one of the biggest factors that contributes to um, resiliency for anyone. 
uh, then that is the protective factor. So when we look at these things, it's not that we're saying, um, I can speak for myself, that I would say both of my children are pretty fiery. Um, they come from two entrepreneurs and two type A personalities. So <laughs> they, uh, they, did it, they didn't um, enter this world with just completely mellow temperaments. So it's not to say that these risk factors are bad. I think the word risk can make it sound like this is a bad thing versus this is just something that when you have a lot of risk factors, it can have a bigger impact on negative outcomes. So it also cues us into where can we support that child? So you know, we're actually, Penn started yesterday, a brand new um, parent engagement network started a, a series of uh, conversations with, uh, with parents about executive functioning because we have a lot of resources available for our kids to learn how do you organize your notebook? How do you, how do you get your things together in a way that you can manage your, your organize your life? Uh, but this is more toward how do we help parents understand their child and how their child thinks so they can interact with their child in a different way that helps them build these strengths. Um, so the goal with risk and protective factors is to recognize that, that risk exists but there's this other side that we can be working on either uh, maximizing what's already there or supporting uh, the, the child or the family or the school or so forth in having those things. So the family, you know, family disharmony, uh, a breakup, harsher inconsistent discipline, and parents with mental health or substance abuse issue would be risky. On the other side, strong family values, supportive parenting, and family harmony and stability. Um, the research tells us that uh, the mother's mental health in particular has a huge impact on a child's outcomes. So we really want to make sure that we're taking care of the whole family, um, that when something is going on with a child, and I'm speaking to the choir here, but you know, when something's going on with a child, you know that that's not happening by itself, that, that oftentimes there's other areas that we can look to see what's going on, why are they behaving that way, and how can we support them? Um, and so I won't, um, I won't go through and read each of these. Um, it's more an exercise to see that um, this one here on the bottom life events, you know, these are some of the things that we're really particularly being impacted by. Yeah, very. So you might want to read them because it's small and hard to see. Oh, okay, sure. I'll read it then. Absolutely. Um, so with school on the risk, um, risk factor side, some of the biggest risk factors in school are peer rejection, uh, school failure, and poor connection to school. So that's one of the reasons why positive school climate is such a big topic area when it comes to school policy. It's creating a positive school climate it's because it's one of one of the factors that makes kids um, puts kids at risk. And uh, the peer rejection piece, what we know from the research, especially as it, as it relates to adolescent development, is what we want to know is that that child has at least one really close friend. So again, it doesn't mean that that child has to be um, extremely popular per se, or have these big social groups. But for that child, let's say as an, an introverted child, just having that one friend that they can connect with, that they know they are fully accepted and they relate to each other can be enough to support them. Um, so on the protective factor side for schools, we have positive school climate, like I mentioned, and creating a sense of belonging and connectedness. So we see this translate. If, you, if you've walked through a school lately, we see this translate in schools because they will come up with their mottos that are on the wall that show their values. And they, they talk about how are we going to make sure that we're being respectful and how are we going to create a space where kids can share their concerns. Lots of schools will have um, a little box where they can, in an anonymous way, put their concerns in the box and have them address that way. So they don't have to be called out, but they can still have this feeling of this is my school. I belong here and I wanna share what's going on for me. So those are some of the ways that we can do protective factors in schools. And then with life events, uh, we have certain life events make things difficult. Like, so the um, transition, like I mentioned earlier to middle school, really making sure that that's smooth and they, they're going from this one teacher, one classroom, situation to 
lockers and several teachers and managing different things for homework. So helping kids really uh, supporting them and getting that organized and understanding that it's going to take a little time. Death in the family or any kind of emotional trauma, which is what a lot of people are dealing with right now, is, is this loss, this deep sense of loss for things. Um, and again, something could be very small to someone, but very big to somebody else. And then on the positive side, um, the number one protective factor across everything is for children is having an, an involved caring adult in their life. So, you know, making sure that uh, sometimes this person is not going to be mom or dad, it's going to be somebody who they feel like they can talk to outside of mom and dad for situations that might be uncomfortable. Um, and then being supportive and available at critical times. And this is another place uh, where our, our parents, our, our uh, people who work with families have had to step up in a little bit of a different way is how do we talk to our kids about something like what's going on in the world with the pandemic or other things that have happened over this last year? And how do we do it in a way where we're not just putting fear um, and worry and increasing their anxiety. So how do we actually share with them relevant, important, factual information and not scare them? And some of that is being very thoughtful and careful. Some of it is knowing who your child is or who the child you're working with is and, and how they're going to take that information differently. But it's certainly an important thing to think about in terms of a protective factor. And then on the social piece, uh, we have on the risk side, isolation, again, something we're experiencing, discrimination, another thing, socioeconomic disadvantages. We have certainly seen that, uh, that some of the disparities got bigger for people and lack of access to support services, which we've seen that as well. And on the protective factor side, what we can focus on is participation in community in the best way we can, which we've done what we can with Zoom um, and other, other kind of things like creating pods. People have created pods of people that they regularly hang out with, things like that. Um, access to support services, economic security and strong cultural identity and pride are on the protective factor side. And so when we look at this, it's really an exercise of thinking, how can we, how can we try to maximize our environment and the places we go, the people we spend time with, and the way that we engage in our communities in a way where we are advocating for these protective factors. Something to know on a kind of bigger, more general scale about risk and protective factors is that they tend to come together. So what we've seen in the research is that, is that certain risk factors are likely to be correlated. Uh, Four big risk factors for, for young people, you know, exposure to criminal activity, drugs and alcohol, violence, um, and early pregnancy are the four top risk factors for, for young people. And if you think about those four factors, you can see a scenario where one could kind of create an environment where others would be likely as well. And so um, we know that they come together and we know that uh, removing even one risk factor can make a huge difference. Also having one risk factor is not likely to bring you to serious um, negative outcomes, but we really wanna manage that so that, so that it becomes very um, cumulative when you start adding additional risk factors. And then more protective factors you have, the less risk you're gonna have. So it's a different way to talk about how we really want to balance that, that risk of protective factor situation. Um, any thoughts or questions around that that is coming up for anyone? So on the um, individual side, these are the things that exist um, kind of in the, in the, in the person um, that can be formal or informal types of things that support a, a, a child's individual resilience. Um, things that can boost that resilience. Uh, some of it is that temperament, that biology. And so it's, it's learning who you are. It's understanding how you operate in the world and really setting boundaries and putting yourself in situations that support you in the way that you fit in the world. Um, it's, it's gaining knowledge. You know, knowledge is power. That, that whole conversation is really true because 
we we can only make decisions about how we're going to handle something from the knowledge we have. So every time you put more knowledge into the system, you now have a bigger range of options for making a decision in, in a challenging situation. So this means that one of the ways we can build resilience with people, and especially for working with people, is figure out what it is that they're really curious about. Be truly curious, engaged in what their interests are and help them build on that knowledge. And then you can use that knowledge almost like we use transferable skills in the workforce. You can use that knowledge then to have it, to reflect on how does this fit in other parts of your life and be engaged in conversation about that. Attitudes and beliefs, that's another big thing that contributes to someone's resilience. If you say, it, just like when you say, I can't do that, then you're less likely to be able to do it. If you see yourself as someone who can't cope or you don't, or you, one of the things that we've had pretty big conversations about, um, I'd be curious what other people who, who are in practice who see this is around stress and anxiety. Um, because Penn has focused a lot on stress and anxiety. One of the things we've seen is that a lot of young people will just say, oh, I have anxiety. I'm just anxious. It's like it's become a little bit of a word that is used to describe I'm uncomfortable with this. Um, when in reality, we all feel anxiety at some level. And there are lots of words to describe what it's like when you feel, when you have those uncomfortable feelings to cope with something. Uh, so, so we've done a lot of work. We actually had a great presenter who talked about change your language around that and look at, look at, um, perceiving this, which is the next one here, perceiving this as I'm uncomfortable and it's okay for me to be uncomfortable. Out of, out of uncomfortable situations comes growth. Really reframing how you think about that can be really supportive in building individual resilience. And then when we look at um, relationships, you know, the things that get in the way, the biggest things that get in the way with relationships is when you start introducing some of these issues. Um, drugs and alcohol, mental illness, child abuse and maltreatment, inadequate supervision being the big ones. Um, but the things that actually build and are protective factors would include things like quality time together. And that really does mean it could be 15 minutes every day and that's it, but it's true quality time where you spend that entire time being curiously engaged with whoever you're spending time with not on your cell phone or your device, but actually curiously engaged in who they are and what matters to them. So that's a big one. Being in community. So finding ways to create that community, which we've talked about has been super challenging during this time. And so what does it take to, to find some way? I loved um, the idea of being you're working on a garden and just getting yourself in a situation where you get to see and, and, and feel like you're part of the world again, but what, whatever it is, finding those ways to be in community, um, they're actually even showing, there's a great, um, uh, I have to remember her name right now. It's, I'll think of it and I'll share it in notes if I, if I don't think of it before, uh, before we get off this, but there is a wonderful TED talk about, um, about stress and the impact on stress on your heart. And actually they studied over a longitudinal study whether stress actually uh, resulted in death from that stress. And one of the things that they showed, the two biggest things that made an impact for that person was if they were able to reframe that and look at it like it's a positive opportunity. And uh, the second one was doing acts of service and being in community. Those two things had a huge uh, impact to mediate those that particular outcome for someone. So. So it just it really highlights how important it is for us to find ways to connect and be in community. We're, we're by nature connected creatures who need to be in, in relationship with people. Kelly McGonigal, that's the name of it. It's, it's Kelly McGonigal and the TED talk is called Make Stress Your Friend. I knew if I just stopped thinking about it, it would come up. <laughs> uh, but it's worth watching. It's like 15, 20 minutes and it's an excellent TED talk. Um, and as I mentioned, especially when it comes to parenting, the biggest protective factor is having an effective, having effective parenting. It's, it's critical that we work with our parents to help them um, really understand how to be with their children um, and how to be regularly, unconditionally engaged in their lives. Um, the research shows that it, it can have a positive impact on even the big stuff like poverty, divorce, uh, bereavement, mental illness, and even COVID.
So we know that this is an incredibly important um, thing to focus on. Um, in community, some of the places we can look is we can look at how are our schools responding. Uh, we did a really wonderful talk. It's actually, we're going to be um, providing it through Parent Engagement Network, but we do an annual stress and anxiety conference. If you're not aware of it, keep your eye out for it because they're really fantastic conversations. Um, but we had a great panel with people from the schools. So I had someone from the Colorado Department of Education, principals, different people from the school aspect talking about how are we responding to COVID-19 from the school level? Where are we putting our focus? And guess where the focus is going? Social emotional well-being. A huge, huge emphasis on, on making sure that our kids' social emotional wellness is good so that they can focus in school. And even the things that the Colorado Department of Education, the toolkits that they're putting out that they'll be providing to a variety of communities in Colorado um, focus on that. So it's really an important thing to look at, you know, how are we gonna respond and how, how do we navigate what's gonna really pick our kids up and give them skills to be resilient. Um, and the learning will come, even though we know there's gonna be a learning gap from this. Um, businesses, you know, how are businesses responding and you know, what kind of environments are they setting up that keep a safe uh, environment for their employees who do choose to go back into work? Health departments, which has obviously been a huge part of this with the vaccinations and how those are being distributed, but also how they're talking about them. Um, opportunities, so finding ways to create opportunities in community. When we look at the resiliency research, one of the things that makes a huge difference is are you in a community where the opportunities include going to a park, visiting a library, having place for youth to safely hang out, building skate parks um, that are safe, those kinds of things, versus you know, somewhere where maybe you have marijuana stores on every corner, alcohol stores on every corner, um, outdoor play is not safe or accessible. Those are the things that we really look at making a big um, impact in our communities is creating those kind of opportunities. Um, cultural expectations, you know, we're in a very big conversation right now about how, how are we going to uh, work together to create an environment where everybody feels accepted for who they are. So that is a, that's a community response. Um, and then faith-based organizations, that's, faith is one of the, um, one of the top protective factors is, do you have, and that can be phrased in different ways, but what is your, we, we said this briefly earlier, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but what's your sense of future? What's your belief in what comes next for you and your life for, for, for the people that you love? So um, faith-based organizations is something that has been shown by the research to increase people's uh, resilience. And then society. So these are some things that are pretty um, related to what we've been dealing with with COVID-19 laws. So things against hate crimes, policies that address, address health behaviors. Um, and these are, we, we see lots of changes in whether it be the age at which alcohol or marijuana is available, um, how accessible it is, those sorts of things, the kind of prevention education we're doing. Colorado is leading in many ways. I sit on a couple of substance use uh, coalitions and in many ways we are leading the way because we were the first to legalize marijuana. So now we are also the first to start having more data and more research. We really didn't have any data on, on marijuana until it was legalized. It, it all came from the same place with very like 5% potency. So we had no information. Now we have opportunities and ways in which we can go and educate young people about the impact of use on their brain development, um, different ways to uh, experience uh, healthier ways to experience the kind of juice that people get out of that. So lots of things are going into prevention when it comes to um, the policies that address that alcohol and, and marijuana use. And then we've also seen the allocation of funds. So the relief that people received uh, to deal with COVID and the changes in their job. And there will is, is continue to be a huge emphasis on social equity. So focusing a lot on removing these disparities, making resources and support services available to our disadvantaged populations that are struggling. So this, um, this picture, can you see it okay? 
I know it's a little bit small. I will describe it. It's a, um, ha have any of you heard or, or been around Bronfenbrenner's ecological model? So a little bit. Um, this is probably, I'm a very theoretical person. I thought I taught um, family theories in university for years. And I love thinking about theory because it, I think it's one of those things that just gives us different ways to, to envision and, and consider what's going on in the world. So this is probably my favorite. And I, it's my favorite because I think it's most applicable um, in your day-to-day -day lives. And when it, what it does is it has the child is at the center of this model. Um, and then the, the next layer, that yellow circle, is the microsystem. The microsystem involves all of the direct contact that a child has. And you can put yourself in there. It doesn't have to be child. It can be a person. Um, all the people that they directly relate to. So that can be parents, teachers, coaches, um, youth pastors. It could be anybody that they are, they have friends, peers, um, anyone they have a direct relationship and they interact with them on a regular basis. What I think is interesting about this model is it talks about how, how these different levels can have an impact on that child's building resilience um, and their own personal development. So the, the peach colored layer here is called your mesosystem. What's interesting about the mesosystem is that, that that is about the interactions between those people in their microsystem. So if you think of a child, this is the interaction between a teacher and a parent. So both people that have a direct relationship with the child, but there are specific things, right, that, that make that interaction more effective or less effective. Good communication, parent-teacher conferences, those sorts of things have an impact. So that's an interesting way to think about it. It can also be a parent and a parent's boss. You know, what kind of policies does that, that particular workplace have for um, being flexible with a parent, being able to deal with their child when they're sick or a variety of other situations. The exosystem are those indirect people who still have a very big impact on the child's development. So uh, a good example of, of someone in the exosystem would be like a police officer. That person can have an impact on the child's development, the child's ability to build resilience based on how police function in that community, but that child doesn't really necessarily have any contact or direct um, interaction with that person. The macro system is our social and cultural, um, social cultural aspects. So the much more worldly ways that, that whatever's happening in the world has an impact. And then the last one is, is what's interesting in this situation, because this is where COVID would fit, is the chrono system. So the chrono system is meant to represent the ways in which something that happens in a particular place and time has an impact in a different way on a, on a child or a person's development. So other examples of that would be like the depression, going through the depression. That is a very specific thing. Uh, the the um, birth of technology, I was trying to think of the best way to say that, but you know, it became a different thing when all of a sudden, not only did we start to have the gigantic cell phones that people kept in their car, but now we actually carry a little computer with us all day long. Those are, those are things that happen in a specific place and time that had an impact. And so when we think about, you know, how are the environments that we're in affecting us? So an exercise that I've done when I'm in a person to person workshop, and I would encourage you to, to do this. It's also something you could do with clients is you could have them map this out. You can give them a blank, they, you can get online and you can find a blank picture of this, or you could just create one, it's just a bunch of concentric circles, but you could have them create their map. Where, what does your world look like? What is your environment? Who are the most, not just peers, friends, teachers, but who are the most important people that you relate to every day? It might be a coach, it might be their favorite teacher, it might be someone who's directing a play they're in, but having them think about, and for yourself, you could sit down and do the same thing. Think about, you know, who are those direct people that are most important to you? And when you do that, you can start to realize um, who is someone that I've maybe lost contact with that really matters to me. And having them in my life would help me be more resilient. It would help me, you know, have this relationship back would be great for me. Um, and then when you start looking at some of the bigger circles, like the 
macro system or the exosystem, you know, the, the, the things that are in your environment, it can help you to recognize, you know, we live in Boulder, you know, what, what does the Boulder community really look like? What, what is this? I guess we don't all live in Boulder. <laughs> we have an out-of-state visitor, but, you know, wherever it is that you live, what does this larger environment look like? And for you, where do you spend the most time in that environment? Where in your communities do you reach out and find areas and um, support systems that really help you and support you? So it's a fun exercise. Um, it can be really fun with teenagers. I've done it with my own kids um, before. And just as a st it's like a touchstone to really help you see yourself and what you're, where you live and how your environment impacts you. So kind of a fun thought. So we were, I was going to do another, I was going to do another breakout here and just have a short conversation about um, where you see risk and protective factors showing up in, in what's present for you in these contexts that we're talking yeah. about. And Barry, do you want to? Yeah, so it's interesting to think about. And um, there's a book actually called The Resiliency Workbook. It's by an author. Her name is Nan Henderson. It's N A N Henderson. It was written a few years ago. Uh, we actually had her come and speak with the Parent Engagement Network when I was there. But what I like about this book is it's literally set out to be like a, a workbook. And so you go through and you read a little about resilience, but then you go through several exercises where she presents a variety of different types of uh, characteristics um, that contribute to resilience. And um, it's just a very, very easy, uh, applicable resource. So if you're interested in, in digging into that a little bit, that would be a fun place to, to get resources. Um, I love this quote. So we're gonna move into to talking about 10 specific strategies for, for building resilience. And I like this quote and I like it because even in what we've talked about here today, people have said things that have referred to this, resilient people don't let adversity define them. Uh, they find resilience by moving toward a goal beyond themselves, transcending pain and grief by perceiving bad times as a temporary state of affairs. It's possible to strengthen your inner self and your belief in yourself to define yourself as capable and confident. It's possible to fortify your psyche. It's possible to develop a sense of mastery. This, uh, this quote speaks to that we can't let something like COVID just take over and, and block us down. We have to be able to say, this is what it is. It'll be here for as long as it's going to be here. And what are my goals? How can I take specific actions uh, today in my life, in my day-to-day -day life that make a difference? I'm a big uh, researcher of happiness. I love, I love reading happiness research. And that's, you know, one of the first things that, that the research says is that if you want to increase your happiness, don't think of it as a global thing, like you're either happy or unhappy. Think about the things you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that bring you joy and integrate them in throughout your day. You know, for some, some people, it might be getting outside on a bike. That's what I do. I get outside of my bike or go swim, you know, petting my dog. There's a variety of things, but you can have like even systems that kind of remind you, go do something just for two minutes, take a break, go do something that brings you joy, true joy. Um, so it's interesting. So I wanna share this with you. Um, Number one thing is find purpose in the present. So, you know, being in the present, not not getting consumed with the past or the future, is a, a powerful way to to add resilience or to build resilience. Um, I want to share this with you. This little clip here. Hopefully, I can make it play. There we go. Now we're here. Some of you have thought of suicide. Some of you are in the darkest of darkest valleys. And I was there once too. I was eight years old, depressed. Nine years old, even darker. At 10 years old, I came to the edge. And I thought to myself, there is no hope. At age 10, I tried to drown myself in six inches and 15 centimeters of water in my home. I told my dad I just wanted to relax, really. To end my life. I had enough. The first two times I rolled over, I was trying to work out how much air I hold in my lungs before I let it out. The third time, my 
my mind, knowing that I wanted to get out of here because of the bullying in my life, because I was going to be a burden to my parents and I had nothing to look forward to. I realized at that moment that if I actually went through with committing suicide, I would leave a greater burden for my parents than they already had. So when I saw in my mind my mom and my dad and my brother crying at my grave, if I went through with it, that one thought saved me. You may have arms and legs, but unless you know three things, number one, who are you and what your value is, number two, what is your purpose here in life, and number three, what is your destiny when you're done here? If you don't know the answers of any of those three questions, you're more disabled than I. If I gave you a billion dollars, would you be happy? If you gave me a billion dollars, it would be very happy. But then if my mom dies tonight, am I happy? No. Life is worth living when you find purpose. Nick, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know. My parents want me to do this. My teachers want me to do that. My friends think that I should do this, and I don't know what to do. And you're torn, man. You don't know what to do. You have to make important decisions, man. You don't know what to do. Who do you believe? Follow your heart. If that's who you want to be, if that's what you want to do in life, One day at a time, you got to come to the truth of knowing who you are and why you're here. William Barclay, he said, the greatest two days in anyone's life, the day you were born and the day you knew why. I know that there are a billion people going hungry. Okay, let me stop that there. So he is... Um, an incredible motivational speaker. He's got several um, hour long conversations that he's had in schools with children, um, variety of different contexts, but it really speaks to the importance of, um, of being able to connect with what is your purpose and, and recognizing that your personal unique attributes, your strengths, your support systems, your environment is the thing that you can, you can tap into. Um, to be present with whatever's happening in your current day-to-day -day life. Oh, the second one here is I'm a huge Brene, Brene, Brown, ugh, Brene Brown fan. Um, if any of you have, have has anyone seen um, her, her, yeah, her YouTube video, The Power of Vulnerability is probably, I think it's still one of the most watched YouTube videos out there. Um, and you guys can hear me okay, right? Because I didn't put my earbud back in. Okay, good. Um, I just think that she says things very well. Her, I connect with her in the way that she does research because I'm kind of a, a qualitative researcher myself. I like being with people, learning from people, uncovering themes. Um, and I think that the things that she has to share are incredibly important. And, and empathy, being able to have empathy and compassion is known to be one of the biggest things that contributes to someone's resilience. And so I'm going to share this little clip as well um, from Brene Brown. Maybe. There we go. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth, staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. 
And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. That's great. So I, I know that many times um, in our conversation, I've made the comment of how important it is to be in relationship and how important it is to connect. And empathy is a tool that is pretty fundamental to being able to truly connect with somebody. Um, it's, it's amazing how much this works with young people because of all the people that we tell what to do, it's young people, rather than just saying, wow, sounds like a really hard day or that must hurt or, you know, really being with them and letting them share what's going on and just being feeling with them. So I think it is a way that we can help to build that connection and to strengthen our, um, our resilience. Um, these are just a few quotes that I think are really fun with empathy um, that span some different contexts. Empathy has no script. There is no right way or wrong way to do it. It's simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting, and communicating that incredibly healing message of you're not alone. Um, Nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can drive out darkness. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can drive out hate. Mother Teresa, let us love, let's, let us use love and compassion. Peace begins with a smile. If we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. I would rather make mistakes in kindness and compassion than work miracles in un unkindness and hardness. Dalai Lama said, only the development of compassion and understanding for others can bring us the tranquility and happiness we all seek. And then this last one, from the chief executive officer of Microsoft, um, if we hope to harness technology to serve human needs, we humans must lead the way by developing a deeper understanding and respect for one another's values, cultures, emotions, and drives. So really addressing that empathy is the base of compassion and that compassion is one of the things that drives our interactions in the world. Um, and that's compassion for others and compassion for ourselves. Staying connected with good company. Uh, some interesting work came out of uh, some different countries that shows that um, right now, in general, being connected is, is a predictor of, of um, positive well being. And with this kind of inability to connect, the impact. Um, there's a, uh, when we look at, I mentioned I like happiness research, when we look at what makes us happy, um, and, and that happiness can, can contribute to our own resilience, um, 
they, they have some research that looks at the, look at the happiest countries in the world. These countries include Denmark, Norway, Costa Rica, Australia, Israel, and there's some common denominators in what's present for those people. Um, one of the biggest one is making time, making time for gatherings and community events and spending that quality time with each other. And so important that we, that we find some ways to do that. We can do, um, I've, done, I've done virtual um, weight classes you know, over this pandemic, just to connect with a group of ladies that I would work out with. So we get on the big, I put it on my big TV and I get my weights out and we see each other and we talk and laugh, but all these ways that we can do that um, and, and really surround ourselves with people who match our values, our beliefs, um, and model that for the children and the people in our lives that, that we work with. Practicing gratitude is a big one for building resilience. Um, I use a gratitude journal. I don't know if you've heard of, of gratitude journals. I love it. It's a, um, it's a daily practice I do every morning and every night before I go to bed where I write down three things I'm grateful for. And one thing I'm going to accomplish that day, one thing I'm going to do, someone I'm going to reach out to in specific and tell them that I'm grateful for them. And then at the end of the day, I write down um, what happened throughout the day that I'm grateful for. So I, twice a day, I touch base with three things I'm grateful for. And I take a daily action to say I'm grateful to someone. It can be someone who gave me coffee at the coffee shop just to say, thank you. You know, I'm grateful for you. Um, focusing on self-care, another important one. Um, I recently, self-care is something we talk about all the time, <laughs> but it's also something that we sometimes don't do that well. Um, what I loved is I recently was in a talk where they were talking about self-care um, and it wasn't about make sure you get those nails done or schedule that massage or whatever we think of as being like the extraordinary things that we do to take care and, and kind of um, nurture ourselves. It had a lot more to do with um, do the things that matter to you that are simple. You know, self-care is being able to say, I'm uncomfortable with this conversation right now. Can we talk in, in a half an hour? That's self-care. It's not necessarily the um, things that cost money or the things that are the big extravagant things. So whether that's reading books or taking time to play music, like you mentioned, Barry, those things that we do that feed our soul are important um, for putting us in a place where we can be resilient. Being mindful is another really important one. So having some kind of a mindful practice, um, I, I'm gonna find this study, I have not been able to find it yet, but a friend of mine who I respect deeply, an, an academic, um, shared this study with me that actually talked about a specific gene that you have that is triggered, less triggered if you practice mindfulness, even if it's just sitting quietly for like 15 minutes a day. Um, and, and this came up because I've, I've had quite a traumatic year outside of um, COVID. I've had two or three major life events happen that have been pretty difficult. Um, one of which was lo losing my brother in January. Um, and so I became my mom's primary caretaker. Um, so that's when my life shifted quite a bit. and. Um, I said, I made the comment that I just felt haggard. I'm like, I feel like I just look haggard, you know? And, um, and that's when he shared this, this study with me where they showed that um, being mindful can actually have an impact on your actual aging. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting thing to think about that it's not just in our, in our hearts and in our souls and in our attitude, but it's also in our biological and physical way of responding reacting to the world that mindfulness can be a really helpful thing. Um, has, have any of you read the, the Power of Habit or Atomic Habits? Those are a couple of fantastic books for really wanting to make specific changes in your life that help you to create, um, create those habits in a way that is effective, that isn't like, oh, you do it for a week and then you don't do it. And one of the things that they recommend, they call it habit stacking. This is in Atomic Habits. Um, habit stacking is take something you already do and add something you want to do to the end of it. So a good example of this is I've had a couple bike accidents that have resulted in some um, trauma to my arms and weakness in my arms. Um, and so what I do is I have a pull-up bar by my desk that has a little strap on it because I can't do the full pull-up. And every time I get up to go to the bathroom, which is something I have to do, I do two or three pull-ups with the little 
pull-up bar. So it's create, you know, instead of saying, I'm going to work out for 45 minutes and then you make that unrealistic and you can't do it. Uh, another way to do that is just to say, I already do this one thing. I'm going to do this simple thing that takes 30 seconds on the end of it. And that's how I'm going to start to create this habit. And what they've shown is that that works very well with mindfulness too. So now I get up every morning and I do 10 minutes of mindfulness and 20 minutes of yoga. And I would love to sit and, and, and be mindful for half an hour, but I know I can do 10 minutes. So it's a way to kind of increase that as you get more time or as you enjoy it more, you might do more of it. So it's a fun way to integrate that into your life if you haven't, haven't found a way to, to find time for mindfulness. Um, another big one for resiliency is setting boundaries. Um, and we talked a teeny bit about this, but it's really about you know, being clear, being self-aware, and then being okay setting those boundaries um, so that you're putting yourself in the best position and using the characteristics you have that, that help you to be resilient. Um, Nan Henderson actually talks about this in her book quite a bit, um, but one of the ways you can build resilience and even resilience in other people like other kids that you interact with is acknowledging those strengths and competencies uh, because as we know, our kids hear and, and they take in what we say to them. You know, the, the, old, the old figure of speech, if you say they're worthless, they'll feel worthless. If you say they're great, they'll feel great. It's true of, of other things as well. And so if you start to recognize, because they may not cognitively be able to integrate that yet, but if you start to recognize, oh, my child is very gentle when, when she interacts with animals. And you say things like, you sure have a lot of compassion and, and you're so gentle with animals. You must really love them. You start pointing out those characteristics or those things that they do, that they really bring their strengths to the world. They will internalize those and they will see those even if they don't know that they're using them that way. Those will be characteristics that help them to be resilient. So that's another really easy strategy. Um, another is anticipating challenges, but not getting hijacked. And what I mean by hijacked is that we're all prone to the negativity bias, where we are likely to register negative stimuli much quicker and more frequently than we do positive. So trying to avoid that and but also saying, okay, I could see that this scenario that I'm, that I'm moving into could be a little bit challenging for me. What are some ways that I might be able to respond to this? Uh, we used to think that young people didn't develop those kind of, if then kind of uh, the ability to do that until they were much older. Um, now the science is very clear that if we have conversations with our kids regularly on how to do this, that they will start to do it much more easily just on their own. So really sitting down and saying, oh, how do you think that's gonna be? transferring that, that stress of something away from the stress and moving it toward what do you have control over? Because that's where the power is, is in what we actually have control over. So really thinking those things through. Uh, this is a, just a thought a, a diagram to kind of say that in a little bit more depth is that, you know, we have these thoughts, these thoughts create feelings, and then we act on those feelings. And oftentimes, what we have to do is create that intentional space so that we take a moment before we react. So acknowledge that maybe we have a negative thought and then name the feeling that's around that. Like I'm angry and, and making all those feelings okay. Um, and then taking a breath and saying, what is the obvious, what's the opposite feeling I could have in this situation? Um, as people who, who work in the field, you might be familiar with like Byron Katie who talks about the way, and she says, just think about every, what are all the other um, poten potential alternative ways that this is going to turn out, um, can be a helpful way to do that. Um, so that's a good resource. There's another, um, there's another way to think about it, which is like uh, sitting, sitting with yourself, taking that time to kind of have that piece of mindfulness in that moment, um, and reframing, which is the, the last one that I have here as a 10th strategy is reframing. Boy, the power of reframing is, um, is incredible. Um, one of the things we've learned is that when you say something out loud, you, your brain registers it more and you internalize it more. So we spend a lot of time thinking in here 
But if we actually speak it out loud, we're more likely to act on it. Uh, and so even when you reframe things, saying them out loud so that that internalizes for you more than what you're thinking in your head. So I'm so angry can become I'm activated because this matters to me. I really care about this. So I think I'm, I'm overreacting. I'm a bad speaker. Or you could say I'm being really brave right now. And helping, helping people in your life do that. You know, if you're working with people, you're working with young people, helping them say, what's another way you could say that? I'm having a hard day. Could be I'm having a busy day. Is there anything I can move to, to create boundaries and remove a little stress? Um, I have to help my child with school when I finish work. Um, can become, I get to play a fundamental role in my kid's education. Um, I do that all the time. I catch myself saying I have to do something and I change half to give, I get to. Um, you don't care how I feel, or maybe it's, you don't understand, can I explain more? Or I can't make a difference in this crazy world, can become, I can only control my own actions, maybe I'll make a difference for someone else. So just different ways to reframe. I think it's an important practice for your own happiness and mental health, um, but also for building resilience and coping with these really challenging times. Um, so we'll save that to the end. Um, so in summary, I, you know, I guess when I think about this situation, when I think about what's happened over this year, um, and in the larger context, when I think about being resilient and being able to push through this crazy life we live um, with the challenges that come at us and the ones that we can expect and the ones we can't expect, I just think it's super important to be gentle with yourself and with others um, and to pay attention to your environment and make those positive changes where you can. Focus on the things that you can control, not the ones you can't. Um, and acknowledge what you do well. I mean, we are our worst critics and we don't always give ourselves that opportunity to say, you know, I'm a rock star at this. And understand there are inherent risks and recognize that you can look for ways to navigate them and then do your best to practice regular empathy, compassion, and gratitude. So that is it. Thank you so much for having me. And we still have a little time if, if people want to stay and have conversation. This is my contact info. Um, that's my email. The podcast is available on all the Spotify, Google, Apple. All you have to do is look up Parenting Well Podcast and it'll come up. Um, that's my personal website. I will warn you, it's under construction right now. So the stuff is there, but it doesn't look as pretty as I want it to look, and some of the stuff isn't there. So I'm trying to get it, trying to get it together. Um, and then I have an online program for divorced dads. So if anybody ever encounters a, a divorced father that um, that you think could use some help, this is a 12 session online program, and the website is Fatherhood After Divorce, and it's a self guided. Uh, my favorite thing about it is that it has. Um, videos. There's like 24 different videos that are sprinkled throughout the 12 sessions um, of dads themselves speaking about the concepts that are shared in the program. So um, that's available as well. That's my stuff. So reach out anytime you need to, you need anything or want to connect more. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> Comments, questions? Uh, what was the name of the, the dad parenting thing? Um, it's called Fatherhood After Divorce. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Shelly, I can uh, post this on our webpage so that uh, there'll be resources there. Perfect. That sounds great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I so appreciate uh, your, your presentation because it, it's a fresh reminder about the things we wind up doing in our practices, but you have it organized in a, in a, in a package that uh, sort of fills my brain in an organized way. So I, <laughs> it made a lot of sense to follow the flow the way you've, you've laid it out. Thank you. Good yeah. reminders about all the things that we probably know, but don't think about them that way. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Uh, Kelly, what were the four correlated risk factors? I, I'm taking notes and I didn't write Oh, that. sure. Yeah, the four risk factors are substance use, uh -huh. um, violence, or, violence, criminal activity, and early pregnancy. Okay, got it. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. 
And Barry, what was the name of the book that I don't know if it's a real book or what? The situation is. It's hopeless but not serious. Oh, okay. I, I keep great. it right here myself. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I'm going to write that one down myself. The Pursuit of Unhappiness by Paul Watzlawick. I couldn't hear that, Barry. Oh, this is a book by Paul Watzlawick from the old Palo Alto Family Therapy Group. And uh, okay. the subtitle is uh, The Purpose, the, the Pursuit of Unhappiness. I've actually never read the book. I just like the title so much. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while we're doing that, it was Nan Henderson. Nan Henderson. Yep. And it's called The Resiliency Workbook. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. This was a this was great. Thank you so much. It really was. Really yeah, fun. thank you. Yes, thank you. You had a lot of information, but you presented it very well and mm -hmm. concisely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. And with your permission, I'll edit the recording and uh, post it on our interface web page, which will stay up. Um, so if people Google you, they'll find it and, and can also watch the video if you're okay yeah. with it. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, reach out anytime. I'm, uh, I'm interested to hear what's going on in the community. I'll check out some of your talks that are coming up as well and, um, and enjoy the rest of your Friday. You too. Thank you. You too. Thanks again, Shelly. Okay. Thank you, Shelly. Yeah. So, thank you. Hope thank to you. See you all next month. And uh, thanks for coming on today.